Our series defending Jacob. How many of you have been watching online? Just raise your hand in the comment section if you've been watching. How many of you all here have been watching the series? Have you been enjoying it? Uh, I wish I could tell you it was almost over, but we might be half done. Uh, because how many of you know there is so many parts of this story, it's hard to cover. Um, I, I may just have to turn it into a book and just write it and, and let y'all read the rest of the sermons. Um, but today, I want to kind of deal with some of the situations that Jacob dealt with once he left home. And remember, he went to a place called Haran because his mother told him to go there to look for a wife. And when he got there, he found a girl named Rachel. And Rachel was feeding her father's sheep at the same time that Jacob showed up. That's the part of the story we're in now. So the Jacob and Esau thing and the blessing and, and the fighting and the heel, all of that has taken place. Now he's a man. And now his life is a reflection of his choices. Because you've heard me say this before. You were born looking like your parents, but you died looking like your decisions. And so now he is in the midst of his choices. But the grace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards Jacob even in the midst of his discrepancies. And I just want to let you know that there is no wall that the, the vines of Jesus cannot climb over to reach you no matter where you are. How many of you all believe in that kind of grace? I don't want to read all of these verses, but the Bible just basically says this, and I'm in Genesis chapter 29, verse 15. The Bible says that Laban, who is his uncle, basically says, um, I heard your mama sent you. To be here, y'all, anybody got an uncle? I was with my uncle a couple of summers. He'd be like, your mama sent you here to make me, I'm going to make you a man, you know. So he goes there and he says, um, well, let's make a deal. If you're going to live with me, rent free, let's make an exchange. Work seven years. He said, you work seven years. He says, what's your price? He said, uh, well, uh, you got a, a daughter named Rachel, if you'll exchange her for the work, then I'll work. It's a deal. Bible says that he works the seven years. He's so in love. Look what he says. It felt just like only a few days. <laughs> Shout, that's some love right there, ain't it? Seven years, nine to five, seven days a week. And he said it seemed like only a few days. At the end of the story, it's time for him to give Rachel to him. And he says, oh, it ain't our custom to give the youngest daughter first. Work seven more years, and I'll give her to you. I really wanted to talk about his reaction, because some of y'all, you know, if people wouldn't have, if he didn't held his end of the bargain, how many of y'all got some gangsta in you? If you would have worked seven years, and then the seven years was up and you didn't get what you worked for, that's okay, let me put it in your language. Go to work tomorrow, work all week, and don't have no check direct deposited into your account Thursday at midnight. As you ain't supposed to get paid to Friday, but you be on there 12 or one. Ain't paid me yet. Now you get me. Let's talk about, even though he is in a difficult place, this is a hard place, Eric. He is in one of the most difficult 
places in his life. But God sent me to talk to other people who are in difficult places to tell you that there is a purpose for this place. Let's talk about the purpose for this place. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. To those of y'all who are watching online and you are in the city of Houston, uh, if you are not here at this service, meet us uh, at Vegan Bay Studios for our central location. We'll be there at 1.30 and we're going to do it all over again. Whole another sermon, whole different vibe. Jacob came to Haran for two reasons. The first reason he came was because his mother told him that I overheard your brother Esau say that he was going to kill you. And since you my favorite boy, I'm putting you in the know. And you better leave while you still can. How many good mamas out there? That it doesn't matter how wrong your child is, you will defend them. Do I got any mama bears out there? You will go to the school with rollers in your head. Crocs, a bonnet, pajama pants, and fight a five-year-old about your little Jacob. Said, you got to go, son. So the first reason he left Haran, Pastor Warner, is because his mother told him, this is your best chance at evading murder. Number two. The second reason he goes to Haran is to find a wife because his mother and father did not want him to marry of what would be called the heathen nation. That meant marrying somebody outside of their religion or marrying somebody outside of their culture. So go where the family is, because at least we know that they share the same value system, James, as we do. So go. Now, don't take American context and put it into biblical context, because then it was perfectly normal for families to intermarry. There are places in the world today where it is still common. So I know we think that it is off-putting, but I want you to remove yourself. Because if you don't remove yourself from the culture, you will miss the scripture. He was doing something normal by keeping it in the family. So he goes to Haran where he finds Rachel. I, I put that into the discussion. is because he's going to one place called Haran. But he's going to Haran for more than one reason. He's going to one place, but the one place has two purposes. And the reason why I want to talk to you about that early is because sometimes we will leave the place because of the first thing that happened. Sometimes we will decide, deduce, and think that because something bad happened in that place, then that place is not for us. But God sent me to tell you that he is so brilliant in his design that he always puts more than one purpose in one place. That sometimes you may endure a hurt in a place, but they that wait on the Lord shall also receive joy in that place. They put Paul and Silas in prison for punishment, but they didn't count on a praise, and they didn't count on a release. So in the same place where Paul and Silas were locked up, they were also vindicated by God to show the enemy that God always has more than one purpose. 
for one place. Are you with me so far? Nebuchadnezzar threw the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace so that they could be lunch, so that they could burn up, so that they could dry out, so that they could be eliminated. But God had another purpose. Not only the fire, but he sent a consuming fire to appear in the furnace as the fourth man who was likened unto the Son of God. Daniel was supposed to be food for the lions. The lions became a pillow for Daniel because God always has more than one purpose. So whatever place you're in right now, you may be in the painful part of it, but if you just hold on, God sent me to tell you there is another purpose for the place you're in. Somebody say there's another purpose. Our pastor used to say it this way, that God is too kind to be mean and too wise to make a mistake. So that even though you're dealing with the tumultuous tenacity of pain, oh, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will be in pain in that place, but they will also mount up with wings as eagles in that place. In one place, the nest for the eagle is a place of rest. The heavier they get, it is a place for escape. Sometimes God puts thorns in your nest so you don't stay longer than you should. Could you imagine how long an eaglet would stay in her nest if the mother did not put needles underneath the feathers, who wants to get out of bed when it is perfect? Who wants to get out of bed when the temperature's just right? Who wants to get out of bed when you don't have any? But, but sometimes you got to get out of it because you got a job to go to. And even though you want to stay in the bed, you get out of the bed because you gotta, you got to go to another place because sometimes going to another place equips you to keep this place. Are you with me so far? Nobody gets to keep a home that stays in a home. Sometimes you have to leave that home to go make the resources to keep that home because sometimes God sends you to another place so that you can survive and keep the place. Do I have any witnesses in this place? and online this morning. Laban said, Jacob, um, because we are related uh, and, and you're going to live with me, I think you should serve me. And some of y'all like serve because people don't like to serve anymore. But service is not a bad word. Uh, in fact, God is looking for they who will worship him and serve him in truth. Somebody say, I'm a servant. He, he says, you should serve me um, for, for a little while. And, 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 and Jacob said, all right, well, what's, what's the pay? What's the pay scale? What's, what's the dollar per hour? He said, well, you name your price. He says, all right, um, well, my price is Rachel, and I will serve for seven years in exchange for her hand in marriage. Now, he didn't make this up on the fly. He didn't just say, I want Rachel. Remember, if you were with us the last couple weeks, he just saw her at the well. How many of y'all remember that? She was watering the sheep. He saw her at the well. The Bible says he looked from a distance, and here is what the Bible says. The Bible says that Rachel was well favored. Now, I got to tell you something. Because the, the word favor in the Hebrew doesn't mean that you have the favor of God. If you look up the word favored in the Hebrew, it means that Rachel was well formed. She's a brick. I mean, from a distance. At the well, Jacob like, dang! Who is that? I'm like, oh, that's Rachel. That's, that's Laban's daughter. You got to have that, dog. Got to have it. I'm about, I'm about to wipe her. I, I got to have her. I can't, I, can't, I can't let her get away. So he says, I want, I want the well-favored daughter. Now, he gets into the house and recognizes that there are two daughters, but there is an issue. The Bible says that Leah, 
exact words, has a delicate eye. Well favored, delicate. <laughs> well favored, delicate. I like favor. So I worked seven years for favor. Don't you miss me. I worked seven years for beauty. And the Bible says that Rachel was beautiful and well favored and well formed. And the Bible says that all of a sudden he falls in love. But the Lord told me this, and I'm telling you, this is going to help a lot of people. Here their relationship starts. But the Lord showed me something. And, and it is something that all of us are, are guilty of knowing but not always pursuing. When Jacob sees Rachel for the first time, she is working. Now, Rachel sees Jacob working for the next seven years. And then the Lord gave me a revelation that relationships are about work. And they stop working when the workers stop working. Come on, help me out. How many of y'all have ever been guilty of stopping the work? Because when you get in your feelings, you quit. When we get in our feelings, we opt out of the responsibility. So the revelation that God gave me is that relationships are work. She was working when he met her. He was working for her. And the relationship started working. Are you listening to me? Christian or not, preacher or not, Rich or not, poor or not, male or female, American, domestic, foreign, tall, short. It doesn't matter what your stature is. If you are in a relationship, they only work when the people in them are willing to do. Help me, y'all. And when the work stops, I don't care how saved you are, it's over. You can bring me to the altar and pray all you want to. You can put oil in their food and pronounce it blessed. When a person has made up in their mind that they're done working, y'all gonna say man, are you gonna say ouch? Are you gonna... Somebody say it's over. So, so the reason why we struggle in any relationship we have is because it stops working. When we stop working on our selfishness, when we stop working on our quick tempers, when we stop working on our jealousy, when we stop working on our attitudes, then nothing works because in order for it to work, then the people inside of it have to work. Listen. He worked for how long? Seven years. Seven years. And what did he say? It seemed like only a few days. Now, why did it only seem like a few days? The Lord revealed this to me as well. He loved her, and love covers a multitude of sin. When you really love somebody, doing for them is a little bit easier than doing for someone else. Who, who am I talking to? He, he, actually, he actually loved her so much that he worked for her for seven years. Now, because of the events of my life over the last three years and what I read in this scripture, I did not recognize something until I looked at it just this past week. He worked for her for seven years, and it took seven years in order for their relationship to take the next step. And then the Lord told me to tell some of you all, based on the lesson that I learned, 
that it can take seven years for a season to change in your relationship. If you're not willing to give that uncomfortable thing seven years, you'll be out of it before you can be blessed. Then the Lord told me, he said, Keon, tell him there is something to it because in order for a week to end, it takes seven days. And tell him when I was on the cross, in order for me to get down, I had to speak seven times. Y'all not praying with me today. He says, when I created the world, I rested on the seventh day. And even though seven is not a time constraint, what God told me to tell you is sometimes it may take a long time for the status to change. And so when you give it 90 days, when you give it one year, you haven't given it enough time because sometimes it may take seven years for him not to be stubborn. It may take seven years for him not to be a mama's boy. It may take seven years for that person to get the same kind of work ethic that you have. It may take seven years for a person who's married to an unsaved person for them to even hear or want to go to church with you. I'm talking to somebody. And you may be in there talking about, if it ain't, listen, if it don't happen in the next year, I'm out of here. But what if God told me to tell you that you could be unhappy for seven years and it would take seven years for the season to change? If you knew that kind of work going in, who would choose it? It could take them seven years to hear what you've been saying every day. It could take them seven years for them to get the subliminal message that you're trying to send. It could take seven years for you all to get on the same page about how you discipline your children. It could take seven years for them to understand how affectionate you need them to be to stimulate your mind. It can take seven years for them to understand that you just need to be hugged for 30 seconds. It can take seven years for them to understand that they don't speak to you when you walk in the house. Raise your hand if I'm helping you so far. Because sometimes we think that two counseling sessions and one fight should fix the whole thing. Seven years for him to get to the next level with his woman. But he kept coming to work. And he stayed on the job. And the Bible says it was easy for him because he loved him. I wish I had time to tell you what love was. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these three is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have ever. No greater love has any man than this, that he will lay down his life for his friend. When, when the Lord said, Peter, he said, uh, will, will you feed my flock? He says, because if, if you love me, you will do it. See, he wanted to find out, Peter, not are you a hard worker, but do you love me? Because if you love me, you'll work for me. Y'all not, not getting this. So what I'm trying to tell you is the reason why our neighborhoods are so selfish, the reason why America is so selfish, the reason why we're fighting amongst one another, it is not about political parties. It is about a lack of love. We don't have enough love for one another. We don't love our brethren as we love ourselves. And when we start loving each other, even though we are different and even though our skin is not the same color, and when we start loving each other, whether we're rich or poor, and whether we start loving each other, no matter what sin we have committed, because the truth is... It's most people hold back their love when they are offended, but they want love when they are the offender. Somebody say, I love you. Just tell your neighbor, I don't know you, but I love you. 
I love you. And the devil is tricking us because we, t we, we don't understand how important love is. I don't have to know your name to love you. We don't have to be best friends. All I, wanna know, I, wa all I want you to know is I want the best for you. I want God to bless you. I want God to lift you. I want God to encourage you. I want God to bless your family. Everybody shout, all we need is love. The Beatles tried to tell us. Faith, hope, love, and the greatest of these three is love. And if you go to the New King James Version of the Bible, it says faith, hope, and charity. Oh, God. Why? Charity is something you give to the poor. And charity is something you give to somebody who can't pay you back, which means that I should love you even if you can't love me. I'm going to talk to this side because some of them over there looking at me out the corner of their eye. The reason why love is called charity is because it is given to people who don't have the means to give it back. Yes, you can love somebody who loves you, but what do you do to somebody who's so broken that currently they can't love you back? That means sometimes y'all going to be arguing in the house. And it's going to be their fault, and you're still going to have to hug them because it's charity work. It's not equality. It's not me paying you back love because you gave me love. Love is charity. Guess what? If I got the strength today and I got the patience today, you could be wrong today, but it is my job to act like I haven't been offended because this love I have is charity, not exchange. Who am I talking to in this place? Who am I talking to upstairs? I don't know what sermon you came looking for today, but I came to tell you there's a purpose for this place. And the purpose of this place is to show you how to love when you don't feel like loving and when you feel unloved. Because the church keeps telling you, you got to have faith no matter what. Yes. You got to have hope no matter what. Yes. But the greatest of these three is love, which means that your love ought to be stronger than your faith. Help me in this church today. God so loved the world that he gave of himself, even when he didn't get anything from the people he gave himself to. Peter, if you love me, You'll feed my sheep. It took me a long time to recognize that the one thing love is not is selfish. That the problem with most of our love languages is that we love people in the same way we want to be loved. But the truth is, is you have to love a person the way they need to be loved, even if it's not the way you understand love. And I went to the school of hard knocks to be your professor today to show somebody in this room who may not be proficient in this language that love is charity work. Which means you have to love the person who least deserves it. You still got to love the dude that hurt your daughter's feelings. She done stood up and said, Reverend, you in my lane now. I'm sorry. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't saying nothing else about that. She done stood up. You know a sister's serious when she stand up and pull her dress down. I ain't, I'm done. What does Jesus say? If you love me, you'll keep my... Not if you're perfect. Not if you're holy. Not if you're intelligent. But just if you love me. Because when you love me, You'll do the things that please me. You don't feel like cooking? No, but if it pleases him. You don't feel like washing her car? It's hot outside, but if it pleases her. Oh, y'all, I'm going to come down here now. I got an attitude. You don't like cleaning up? But if it pleases him. I was raised like this. All right, that's how you was raised. But, but how do you love? Because we always want to talk about how were we were raised. But my question is, how do you love? 
Well, I was raised, we didn't hug people. But if it pleases me, give me a hug. I didn't grow up in a house with affection. That, that's just fine. But if it pleases me, slob me down. That part. I want you to know I ain't accidentally said it. I'm here. I know what I said. I drunk protein this morning. They told me I got to be done a certain time. So, Aaron, I'm going I'm to be done, Aaron. I got you. All right. This beautiful love story, Sarge. This beautiful love story, man. Beautiful love story. Lord told me it took seven years. And if you're writing notes, Mama Vicky, here is the first thing the Lord told me that the purpose of this place is to learn patience. Woo. Any impatient people online. And in the house. You, you, you working on my. I ain't even all the way right. I'm not, I'm not even right. So you can't play with somebody who don't start off right. <laughs> I ain't even right to begin with. The purpose of this place. It's for us to learn that sometimes it takes longer than you're willing to wait. How many of you wish you had known that 10 years ago? That the purpose of the place, 25, that the purpose of this place, I was, y'all got time? No. I, was, I was recently talking to a, a pastor and he had a couple in his church who had gotten a divorce. And they had been married, I don't know, I think 25 years. Gotten a divorce. He went his way, she went her way. One of their parents died. You know, something about their relationship, they stayed in contact and they stayed friends. The father died. Guy shows up for the girl. They're in their 60s now. They end up getting remarried. And the, per the pastor that I was talking to, he said something profound to me. He said, if they had stayed together for that period of years, time would have made them what they eventually became. Sometimes, in the midst of the walk and in the midst of the journey, we don't recognize the purpose for the place. And we leave the place without learning the lesson of the place. And if you don't learn the lesson of the place, you'll end up in the same place. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is that if you don't learn the purpose of the place, you will make every place this place. You will be unhappy everywhere you go. You will be frustrated everywhere you go. You will feel like a victim everywhere you go if you don't learn the purpose. Clap your hands if I'm helping. Okay. All right. If you want me to go deeper, say go further. All right, so, so he gets to this place and he learns patience but this love story is tainted by the character of his uncle Laban because this joker ain't no good. He ain't no good. One writer said that his heart was covered by the cosmetic of deceit. Most women will understand this, that cosmetics can change the appearance, but they cannot change the person. How many of you ever seen somebody all dolled up, makeup laid, hair as they say in the old school, fried, 
died and laid to the side. Fellas, zero to two percent body fat, walk around, swoll up all day long, got to turn like this just to turn directions. More money than they can spend, but it's makeup. Cosmetics. And the reason why I talk about that is you know that you're dealing with somebody who's cosmetic when you cannot get close to them without having a stain. You always know you're in the proximity of someone with just a little bit too much. It's because you cannot get close enough without having the mark of proximity on you as you release. And if you don't recognize this, you better hear me that that is one tough stain to get out. Cosmetic people. If you work for me, I'll give you Rachel. It's makeup. He has no intentions. Oh, my God, I wish I could be here all day long. He has no intentions of being good. He has no intentions of being honest. He has no intentions of being better. He just wants the labor. You must understand that there are some people who only want you in their life because when you showed up and start working, things started working. But it was cosmetic. He did not intend to do his nephew right. And let me tell you something. Everybody in here listen to me. If you don't intend to be right, leave people alone. Leave them alone. I'm old now. I ain't young like I I know when you were younger, you could try to figure it out. But when you get 40 and 50 years old, ain't nobody got time to be playing with you. If you ain't serious, go set your butt down somewhere. Please. You will save somebody years of pain and yourself too. Spare that person. Because let me tell you something, nobody gets out clean. Don't nobody get out clean. Everybody gets stained. He had no intentions of being who he said. He said, all right, come on and work. Come on and work. I got work for you to do. I got work, baby. I got a job, baby. He said, come on and work. He worked for seven years. Seven years of work, and it seemed like only a day. But at the end of the seven years, Jacob goes to Laban and says, hey, man, I'm ready to get paid. It's Friday. I've been working for seven years. Reverend Adams, I am ready to be paid today. Now, if you use your imagination, you know what kind of payment Jacob talking about. He been looking at favor for seven years. Come on now. Five more years to go. <laughs> it's payday. Laban says, oh, nephew. Made a mistake. 
It is not our custom to give the younger daughter away before we give the oldest daughter away. Look at this gangster. Talking about custom after arrangement. Because they both know the arrangement. And I have a problem with Laban that he owes Jacob, but Jacob has to go to him to get paid. You know why? Here it is. Laban is selfish. And selfish people always wait. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Now, some of y'all going to opt out of this part of the sermon, depending on which one you are. Selfish people always wait. I'm going to wait to see if they speak to me before. If they don't say sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sorry when they say sorry. But until then, selfish people always wait. Listen, this is how you know you're selfish. You're willing to give it after them. I'll hug you after you hug me. I'll cry if you cry. <laughs> you hold my hand, I'll hold it back, but I ain't going to reach out and... I know you're there, but unless you slide your foot over there, I'm going to pretend to be asleep. Some people got that down, they be. Lord, don't let that, don't touch me. Please, Jesus, don't let them touch me. If I could just act sleep, then they'll think I'm asleep. If they think I'm asleep, then they'll go to sleep. So we'll both be asleep. A selfish person primarily is concerned with you fulfilling your end of the agreement while they negotiate time to fulfill their end of the bargain. Your change needs to happen now, but you need to understand why it's taking them a long time to change. You need to be better now, but not me because I'm selfish. I've been this way a long time, so I need you to be patient with me while I learn how to be unselfish. But because I'm selfish, I expect you to do in time what I can't do on time because I'm selfish, but I can't admit it because I'm too selfish to have. How many of y'all know any selfish people? He's selfish. Why would he do his own family like that? He said, ain't no pain like family pain, you know? It, it's the, the kind of pain that comes with somebody you didn't expect it from. The kind of pain that comes from somebody that you worked seven years for. Seven years and this is what I get? I didn't come in late. I didn't take a day off. I gave it everything I had. I know, I know that you know that because he's getting ready to ask him to work another seven years. You don't ask anybody to double down on the effort that wasn't good in the first. So we know that Jacob, and I'm here to defend Jacob, we know Jacob did what he was supposed to do. But old selfish Laban, who has these ways about himself that he just either can't cure or won't cure, while demanding the work be done by Jacob. He's selfish. And if there is one altar that I came to destroy today, is the altar of selfishness. <laughs> Laban is pretending to be on Jacob's side. And God told me the second purpose for this place 
is for you to find out who's pretending. I'm telling you now, there are some people in your life that are pretending. And there are some people in this room who are in the lives of other people and you, my friend, are pretending. Pretending to be happy. Pretending to be loyal. And at the end of the day, you don't have to do it. Laban did not have to do Jacob this way. The Lord sent me here today on assignment to tell us that it is time that we tear down the altar of selfishness. And it's hard because the first law of nature is self-preservation. But we can't keep talking about the first law of nature when we're talking about selfishness and then talk about I live in the kingdom of God when they talk about money. You ever, you ever notice how people keep changing kingdoms? When they need a blessing, I'm in God's kingdom. When it's about change, I'm only human. When, when, it comes, when it comes to being blessed and highly favored, what is it? It's, you know, I'm, I'm in the economy of God. When it comes to changing who we are as a person, I'm only human. Either you are spiritual or you are human. And by that we mean flesh. We all know we're human, but that is not monolithic in its explanation. We're talking about carnal or spirituality. And if the rules of the kingdom govern my life in resources, then they govern my life in the way I treat my brothers and sisters. Somebody repeat out to me, God, I don't want to be selfish anymore. And I don't need anybody in here to fake this because God sent me here to destroy this altar. If you have ever been selfish in your life at any time, and if you have any selfish ways, I want you to spend the next 30 seconds talking in the heavenly language. And I want you to connect to God online and in this building and say, God, I came to tear down what selfishness has built up in my life. I don't want to be selfish anymore. I don't want it my way or the highway. I don't want to do the things that I've been taught. I want to break that altar down because when you are selfish, you mess up the flow. Raise your hand if you've ever been selfish. Thank you for being honest. I have. I have. You know you're selfish. You, you pre-plan your reaction even before you got a problem. You already know what you already know what you're gonna do before it even happened. But that's selfish because you haven't given grace an opportunity to mandate something different from you. Because when we are carnal, we are selfish. Let me tell you something about the flesh, and I'm going to give you the last point. Have you ever noticed that everything you do for your flesh has to be repeated? Okay. All right, so y'all remember when Jesus was at the, the well with, with the woman who had had five husbands and the, hus the man she was with? You remember what he said? Repeat after me if you notice. Know if you drink of this water, you will never what? Okay. Because that was in the spirit. Now, in the flesh, she still had to drink water every day. Because anything you do for the flesh has to be repeated. You have to take a bath, hopefully, every day. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. You have to eat every day. Listen, just on a side note, we fasted the last 24 hours. How many of y'all fasted with us online and in the house? We fasted. I called Pastor Torrance at about 3 o'clock and said, man, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to fail. We started talking to each other. I said, man, I'm so hungry. He said, you too, Reverend? I said, I'm shaking. He said, me too, Reverend. I said, I just imagined that I was eating nachos with chili on it. Now, that ain't even nothing I eat. But I starved my body. And my body became selfish, and it wanted something 
that wasn't good for it. And when you are selfish, you consume the wrong things. Lord, destroy the altar of selfishness. Say it again. Lord, destroy the altar of selfishness. Say it again. Lord, destroy my altar of selfishness. You won't even know you're selfish until it's too late. I know if you're honest, sometimes I have to look back on myself and say, that wasn't right. You didn't have to say that. But selfish people want to feel better and not be better. Because I'll feel better if I tell you what's on my mind. But in order to be better, sometimes I have to keep what's on my mind to myself. And when I get to the point where I can keep what's on my mind to myself and still feel better, now I'm maturing because now I don't need to spew venom on you to feel good about me. I'm doing the best I can. Let me hurry up and leave. So the purpose of this place, the purpose of this place that you're in is to learn patience. The second reason is to learn who's pretending. The third purpose of this place is to learn perseverance. When it came to Laban, when it came time for him to give Jacob Rachel, <laughs> Laban switched girls on Jacob. So Jacob goes into a dark tent thinking that it's Rachel. Can you imagine how excited he is? Seven years of anticipation for old Rachel. And he goes in there and he, he doesn't know who's in there because you have to understand that they got the same mom and daddy. Just because Leah was cross-eyed doesn't mean she wasn't fine too. Come on, holler at your boy. Now, just because her eye was delicate doesn't mean she wasn't stacked like her sister. <laughs> See, y'all, if you read the Bible for real and stop being so holy, this thing is entertaining. Some of y'all be reading the Bible, thou art God who created the heavens and the earth. I be reading it like, and Rachel, what you did? What, what, what? So he go in there, okay, oh, and I hear, I hear you, I know, I know, I know, I can hear you women. Yeah, but he should have knew her voice. <laughs> Why does my dude, man? And if you know anything about the custom, Pastor Torrance being a theologian, he will tell you this. Am I right about this, Marcia? She was heavily veiled. She, she, <laughs> woo, let me hurry up and get through. <laughs> Cleo, let me get out of here. He's, he's, he's he, heavily, heavily veiled. Mother Hammond, she, 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 she's, she's hidden. Like if you look, if you've ever been to the Middle East, or if you've ever seen anybody from the Middle East who now resides, you, you, you go through the Galleria, you, you can't, the only thing you can see is. So that's her attire. Literally her lingerie. Because in that culture, covering up. Y'all ain't going to tempt me. Mm -mm. I'm 49. I ain't 35 no more. I know better. So it's a whole mixture. So you got a woman, and, 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 and you got a possible whisper. And the Bible says he had a vial of drink. Now, isn't that a recipe for a disaster? <laughs> She's delicate. He been waiting and he drunk. What would you do? See, this is the problem. I can't, I can't stand church folk because they always holy until they got a vial. 
Y'all are always judging folk, but I want you to put yourself in Jacob's position. He's been waiting for seven long years to get with a fine, favored woman. It didn't matter how tender her I was. Jacob said, I'm taking one for the team. Now, you can say whatever you want to say about Jacob. I'm defending Jacob. Leah knew she shouldn't have been in there. Why y'all up here judging? Jacob, she was fully clothed. Jacob didn't know who was in there, but Leah knew who was in there. Oh, I'm Jacob's lawyer. You can say whatever you want to. Leah knew she wasn't Rachel. So Leah didn't say nothing, which means that she wanted Jacob the whole time. It was, it was coming to America one all over again. How come she always gets the good ones? Shannon, don't look at me like that, man. So, say what you want. I work for Jacob. Jacob didn't know who was in there. No, he didn't, Shalene. I'm telling you right now, but Leah knew. Leah knew she ain't had no business up in there, but she went in there anyway. She could have said in there, oh, Jake. I mean, I'm good with this, but this Leah. I ain't going to say no. I just want you to know who in here. <laughs> she, she, she ain't say nothing. I got to let y'all go. And then I saw something. Can I teach you the difference between jealousy and envy? How many of you, by show of hands, think she was jealous of her sister? How many of you, by show of hands, and online I want you to put it in, how many of y'all think she was envious of her sister? Oh, man, y'all so smart. Y'all so smart. Ain't you a smart people? Because jealousy is when you kind of wish ill of somebody you're in opposition with, but envy is wishing you had. Now, I know some of y'all didn't know the difference, but you've been in school so long, you know not to go with the first answer. You just went up second on, <clears throat> I'm just going to guess on this one. I'm going to go with envy. Because <laughs> I didn't know the difference until I studied it. She was envious. She spent seven years wanting the same thing that she saw her sister about to have. And so she became frustrated that her younger sister was about to get married before her because remember what the custom was, the older daughter gets married first and the older daughter can't, uh, the younger daughter can't get married until the older daughter gets it. So now the order has been changed. And now the older sister has to see God have favor on the younger sister the same favor that was on Jacob. When you're looking for somebody to spend your life with, look for somebody who has the same favor that you have. So now, and I gotta, I'm going to preach the rest of this at Central, so if some of y'all want to come to the after set, that's where I'm going to be. She's frustrated with her sister, and here it is, I'm done. She's upset because her sister's season has come before hers.
all the envy that has been brewing in the earth because you see somebody else winning before it's your turn. Never let somebody else's season send you into skepticism. When it is your turn, it will be your time. And you don't have to do anything to rush or to fast forward or to manipulate when God says it is to be so. Somebody say it is so. In the morning, Jacob woke up, recognizing it wasn't her. And he went to his uncle and said, man, you tricked me. And he said, well, you know, I am selfish. But I tell you what, if you serve another seven years, you can have her. I am amazed at Jacob's response. Jacob didn't pull out a knife like Peter. He didn't pull out a slingshot like David. He poured out humility like Jesus and said, yes, I will. You will know that you have changed when you stop responding the way you used to. And I can't help but feel that Jacob must have thought, man, I kind of deserve this because I've been tricking people out of stuff my whole life. And so I'm not going to be so upset when somebody offends me because I have been offensive. Oh, God, help me. Because I want to say that Jacob shows us that the accusable shouldn't be so analytical. Isn't it amazing how many broken people have something to say when you are going through your broken season? The world is so full of judgmental people who, when you have fallen down, are judging you. But if they were famous like you, or if people knew them like they know you, or if they were a supervisor like you are, and their raggedy life was put on display like yours, we would know that they got bigger issues than the people we know about. Y'all better say amen in this place today. It's amazing how people who are broken can be so judgmental. Your life is not good enough for you to pass judgment on anybody else. You got too much going on in your life to be gossiping. Help me if you can't help the person next to you. His response is tapered by his experience. You need to remember what God brought you through. You need to remember how many mountains he carried you over. You need to admit that you were one day away from a divorce yourself. And you need to admit that you got a job and don't nobody know you're a felon. And you need to admit that you have two children, three children, and although we all think they belong to the same person, and yes, you have been through a bankruptcy yourself or two, and you've gone through repossessions, and you have stolen from your job, and you lied about being sick because you wanted to go to Cabo. Uh, I got COVID. <coughs> ah. I'm gonna be down six months. All have 
have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I came to tell the church today that God told me to tell you that it does not matter, Jacob or Rachel, what you have been through. I am the Redeemer and I still live. And I've got grace for that. And every morning there are new mercies. If there's anybody in this room that has ever been the beneficiary of the mercy of God, I want you to give him about 30 seconds of praise that he did not throw you away when you were wrong. I got more sermon than I got time. Somebody say thank you for the grace. Come on, somebody say thank you for the grace. If it had not been for the Lord on your side, it was not about your money. It was not about your connections. It wasn't about your intelligence. It was the grace of God. Stand to your feet. purpose of this place is to show you not to quit. It's hard to work when you're disappointed. It's hard to work when you look like a fool. Could you imagine how hard it was for Jacob to show up the next seven years? Working for somebody he really don't trust but he trusted in the Lord who is the maker of both heaven and earth. And without giving you the rest of the sermon because I got more sermon than I got time, most theologians don't differentiate the fact that it seems like Jacob really worked 14 years to get her, but if you do the math and the chronology, by the time Rachel gives birth to her first son, Joseph, it was before the seven years was up. Even though man had said it was going to be seven years, God says, I'm going to fast forward this thing. How many of you know that God will fast forward it for you? That he will redeem the time. And what it takes somebody else seven years to do, God says, I'm going to give it to you in seven months. How many of y'all believe that you're getting ready to walk into a season where God is going to expedite the situation for you? Somebody shout, do it, Lord. Say it again. Say, do it, Lord. So Jacob said, go ahead. Have your honeymoon with Leah. Stay with her for a week. Then I'll give you what you've been waiting for. God told me to tell you that it ain't going to take that long. I don't know who this word is for. That although I told you it might be seven years of a difficult season, because you've got the favor of God on your life, Pierre, God says you won't have to wait so long. If you believe it, say, I receive it. He says, once I teach you patience, then I don't have to make you wait. You got it. If it takes you seven years to learn patience, then it'll be seven. But if you learn it in seven days seven weeks, seven months, I will fast forward the process and I am getting ready to give you the ability to walk in your destiny prematurely. You're going to get there before anybody else expected you to get there. You're going to get there before you expected to get there. You're going to get there before anybody believed you would. If I'm talking to you, say that's for me. So those of you all who are up there, the word of God doesn't just work for people on the front row. For you, sir, waving your hand all the way in the back, the word of God is nigh thee. Yeah. And that whatever you've been waiting for for your family, whatever you've been waiting for and praying for for your children, and whatever financial difficulties you have been dealing with, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that they are over. And God is about to reward you, and he's going to redeem you, and he's going to review you and reward you. I can tell you're a man of faith. I can tell you're a man who loves your family. I can't even see your face, but I can see your spirit. I've got lights in my face. All I can see is you holding a baby and see your hand moving. But God told me to tell you that the hand of the Lord is upon you. And God is about to bless you with more than you have room enough to receive.
whoever you are, whoever you are, sir, God says that you are a servant of a church and that whatever church you join, you will be one of his greatest servants. And he said, based on that service, he's going to bless you that men will serve you. Whatever you're building is going to turn around and men will serve you. Receive the word of the Lord. If you're in this place today, you've never been saved. They don't do this at church no more. I'm going to do it today. If you have never been saved and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never said, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, if you've never fallen on your face and say, God, I'm selfish and I need you to tear down my altar. And I want to connect with a local assembly. Online, the same thing goes for you. They're putting instructions up on the screen right now. This is what we call soul salvation. It's not enough just to go to church and say, I'm connected. Will you be committed? Will you work for God while he's working for you? If you're in this place today and you're not a member of a church, if you never accepted Christ, or maybe you've accepted him, but you want to get back on the ball, I want you to meet me at this altar right now. I want you to meet me at this altar right now. I know you got your mask on. They'll keep you socially distanced, but I need somebody to take a step for Jesus. And when they come, I want you to begin to bless the Lord. I want you to begin to bless the Lord when they come. God bless you, my brother. Come on, Lighthouse, make it a big deal. They'll take you that way, and God will perfect. God bless you. Come on, Lighthouse, as they come, and you're blessing the Lord. Somebody shout, sooner or later. It's going to turn in my faith. God bless you, daughter. Come on, Lighthouse. Make it a big deal. It's turning around for me. It's turning around for me. It won't always. God bless you. God bless you. There's another family. There's another family. Some are joining online right now. Welcome to your church. Welcome to your family. Sooner or later. Still coming. Sooner or later. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. Turning around. God bless you. God bless you. First of all, this is Rena's family right here. I'm just a quick volunteer. Somebody I don't know. Sir uh, in the white shirt. I don't know you. Do I, do I know you? You don't know me. Come here real quick. Okay. Because see, y'all don't believe God is real. All right. I want you to stand here. Come up here. Don't worry about it. Come up here. I want you to stand here. I want you to look up there and tell me, can you see anybody? Uh, no, sir. Can you see anybody's face? No, sir. Can you make out anybody's countenance, anything? Do you know anybody up there? Just silhouettes, sir. Okay, just silhouettes. So all I see is silhouettes. I've never seen this man a day in my life. But remember the prophecy. He's going to be a servant in the church. He comes to me and says, sir, they hired me to be the floor guy in the Dream Center. Wow! Tell me God ain't real. I need somebody to open up their mouth and begin to give God some pride. I got a 
say this and we're going to be going. Look at how God does things ahead of time. See, prophecy doesn't work. It didn't happen because I said it. I said it because it happened. Y'all not here with me today. And I decree and declare that this is not the end of the work. That God is getting ready to do more for you than he's ever done before. Do you work other than that? Do you, do you, okay. You own your own company. What, what other skill sets do you have? You're a general contractor. Jackie, are we still looking for a, a building maintenance man? You're hired. Please step down, sir. Step down. You got a full-time job. You got a full-time job. Somebody give God some praise in this place. Let me tell you, he got the right spirit. He says, sir, I own my own company, but this is my guy right here. He's in between jobs right now. Can he have it? Yes! Somebody give God some praise. Somebody give God some praise. Somebody give God some praise. Somebody says it's gonna turn on my face. Jackie, how long have we been looking for that position? We've been looking for a position to fill for over a year, which shows you that God will never let anybody take your space, that he will keep it vacant for a year if you will trust him. Look me in my face, sir. If I can trust you, you can trust me. You give me 1% of your trust, I'll earn the other 99. If I can trust you with this building, you are hired, you have a job, and there is plenty of work to do. And let me tell you, this ain't the last building we're gonna build. The purpose of this place was to show you patience. The purpose of this place was to show you who was pretending. The purpose of this place was to teach you perseverance. And they, remember this scripture. I don't know how many of you know, don't forget this one. They that wait on the Lord. What'd you say? Those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Shall renew their strength. They will have wings. They will fly and never walk. God bless you, my brother. I love you. Hallelujah. All right, let's go home. So I, I wanted to bring the gentleman up here. Thank you for, for your help, sir. Because a lot of people, they look online and haters will say it was planned. But if you stand here, you can't see nothing. Never seen that man a day in my life. I had no idea that he was hired to be the floor contractor for the Dream Center. We won't even have a floors yet, so I haven't been over there to see a floor. Kim, how many days ago did I just pick the floor? I just picked the floor a week ago. I didn't know who was going to do it. I just know what I wanted. Prophecy is not me making God doing anything. It is me proving to you that God does it, and then I announce it. Lord, thank you for these souls you added to the church. Thank you for those who came online. 
Thank you for being a visible demonstration to the church of Jesus Christ that you are still alive. We give you all glory. We give you all honor and all praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody shout amen. Fist bump somebody on the way out. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. screen if you want to join be a part of what we're doing here hit the number on the screen and remember share send this message to someone someone needs to hear it let's go to the Lord in prayer Father God we just want to say thank you just for the word that was given we pray that someone's heart was touched and someone's mind was changed we love you God all these blessings we ask in your son Jesus name amen hey remember we love you here at the Lighthouse Church nothing you can do about it see you soon